Hello, I'm Dave Ortega from Somerville Media Center, and I'm joined once again with Julia Taliesin. Um, something I, I should bring up really, really quickly. I always say joined with, should I be saying joined with or joined by? What's the proper grammar there? Honestly, Dave, I think it's fine. I, <laughs> you're joined with me, you're joined by me. Okay. I'm well, here. <laughs> I'm joined with Julia Taliesin. From We're joined at the hip. Yes, we're joined at the hip uh, from the Somerville <laughs> Journal. Well, welcome, Julia. How are you? I'm good, Dave. Thank you. How are you? That's going to be the, the weirdest uh, beginning uh, <laughs> to this news roundup that we've Perfect. ever had. But I love it. That's fine. Yeah, keep but, on their toes. Yeah. Yeah, so let's start, as we always do, with kind of just a look at data in Somerville, just to kind of orient ourselves into where we're at. Um, <clears throat> things are you know, our um, moving average has been going down for a while. Um, our percent positivity has remained low, which means that we are testing a lot of residents, which is great. Um, I will say that um, if you've noticed, there has been a jump in the number of fatalities. Um, I, I certainly noticed this and kind of in looking at the data, you can see that um, we also just had a big spike in January that we're coming down from. So it's most likely due to that, you know, um, fatality spiked in the beginning. And it makes sense that they would spike again after, after that um, kind of big curve. Um, so looking at this, you can see we have, let's see, um, 4,545 positive confirmed cases. That's total. And then at the moment, to, um, about 288 probable positive cases. Um, if we scroll down, a little bit more, you can just see that data represented in different forms. You can see that spike in January compared to that early spike um, in the spring and kind of where we're at at the moment, which thankfully is relatively low. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to kind of keep that around for a while, um, especially as we think about reopening schools, which we're gonna talk about um, in a minute. Um, and hopefully we'll, that'll kind of remain because we are sort of heading into the spring. You know what I mean? We're on the other side of, of the holidays at least. Um, so maybe we have, you know, a shot shot at kind of keeping that low. So yep, you can see yeah. that going down. Um, as always, when we do look at this data, um, if you could just continue scrolling down um, to get to those map representations of the yeah. city. Yes. Um, I always want to bring people's attention. Yeah to these maps. Um, these are relatively recently updated. You can see that heat map was updated on February 8th. Um, so again, this um, compared to last time, this is really, um, there have been more cases, but when you again compare that and kind of put it right over that environmental justice populations map, you can see that there is some serious overlap um, and that as always, we need to be thinking about the way that this virus is disproportionately impacting um, our vulnerable communities, not just in Somerville, but across the state. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, that just that these, as ever, uh, these resources are available at SomervilleMA.gov and uh, mass.gov. Yes. Awesome. Um, yeah, so kind of moving into that vaccine um, conversation. So like I said, brand new information, um, kind of where we're at right now, right? We're now moving into phase two, group two, which is that people 65 years old and older. Um, it's um, people with two or more of the specific designated health conditions on the state website. Mm -hmm. um, they did expand that to include asthma um, and residents and staff of affordable senior housing. So those are the newly eligible groups in addition to people 75 and older, obviously, and then also um, uh, first responders and some frontline workers. Mm -hmm. um, so the map, um, let's see, you just, I think you just had the map of vaccination sites pulled up. So this, in the communication that Baker sent out, um, things are changing a little. So up until, um, I think this week states, uh, it may it may be persisting through the end of the month, but states were receiving, uh, not states, sorry, cities and towns in the Massachusetts were receiving a certain number of doses every week. And because of that, Somerville was actually able to hold a clinic and administer about 200 doses to eligible residents, mostly seniors, but also some frontline workers. That is no longer the case. So when we look at this map, this is zoomed into kind of Somerville, um, that red dot right there is the theoretically the closest mass vaccination site that's Fenway Park in Boston. Fenway Park, yeah. These blue dots um, are more general vaccination sites, um, pharmacies, groceries, um, 
there are a couple more of those. Um, but the vaccination sites, like the one that Somerville held, which was at the East Somerville Community School, it was run by the Council on Aging, run by the Department's Health and Human Services, run by the city's Health and Human Services Department, as well as some um, medical reserve volunteers. Um, that is not going to be the case. So from what I know, um, the state will be sending out second doses so that people who received their doses uh, locally will be able to get the second dose because that's also part of the plan. They're trying to make sure that people who get their dose here also get it there. You know what I mean? Right. So it's, it's much more streamlined that way. Um, but the way that this is changing is that there's going to be much more focus on mass vaccination sites as well as regional vaccination efforts. Um, and there's also been a change in kind of the state's position on kind of equity in their distribution. So rather, like I said, most cities and towns will not be getting dedicated doses. However, a handful will. So there, there are, I think, around a dozen cities and towns. Worcester, Framingham, um, nearby Malden is one of the nearest in Everett, I think, are examples of communities that will be receiving local doses of the vaccine um, mm -hmm. because these have been determined to be the, the community's hardest hit um, with vulnerable populations kind of in the state. Um, so we don't really know yet <laughs> kind of like what, what's gonna be happening. Yeah. Um, this could change uh, depending on how things go. Um, but for right now, um, oh, the other thing to highlight is that the whole buddy system piece of news, right? That like people, um, if you give someone who is eligible a ride and you also have an appointment that you are eligible to get the vaccine. Um, so kind of in that realm, there are lots of resources available. The Council on Aging is doing a lot of outreach. Um, they're supporting seniors and walking seniors through this process on the phone, um, as well as online. Um, the Somerville Cambridge Elder Services Organization is offering free transportation to seniors who need a ride to their appointment. So um, there's been some chatter about how kind of the whole buddy system thing has meant that you know, Craigslist has suddenly gone wild with people offering to give people rides right. in order to get an appointment and a vaccine themselves. So if that's something you want to mess with, that's for you. But just so you know, there are free, local, trusted transportation options available for seniors and eligible populations. So right. just and keep that it. That has been controversial. Um, yes, and, it has been controversial. It's been, it's been faced uh, with a lot of criticism from lawmakers and uh, citizens at large, you know, just uh, about, you know, why should potentially a, a young person who's slated to get the vaccine with the general population be moved up uh, at this point. Um, and then the counter argument is like, well, the more people vac uh, vaccinated, the better. Um, but still, it's 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 a it seems like a loophole in uh, in this uh, uh, kind of phased system that seemed yeah. very clear. Um, so that's that's interesting. <laughs> and again, it does raise a question. I think again about equity because theoretically, these people who are offering to give rides to people, they have access to vehicles, right? So right. that's also kind of a determinator that this person would also be much better equipped to get themselves when that becomes available for their group to a, to a site, whereas other people already who are eligible now, right, are not equipped to do that. So on one hand, it could be seen as generous. On the other, it could be seen as taking advantage of a situation. You know, who's to say, I th I'm sure it depends on the situation. Um, but just, I think it's important in what I kind of wanted to get out here and what I know you do as well is that like Somerville is is doing a lot, you know what I mean? So try to like get in touch with the like local boards and officials and um, to see what's already out there that is just available to you as a resident, you know what I mean? Because there is a good amount. Um, and also I'll say that their services are um, being offered in a number of languages. Um, they're holding a kind of like call-in Q&A, a virtual Q&A on Monday, February 22nd. Um, that is going to be in English, but they have held some Q&As in other languages and also will be holding some others in different languages. And um, Somerville's kind of four primary, which is Spanish, Portuguese, Haitian Creole, and Nepali, as well as English. Um, so just those resources are up on the website. A lot of the resources can be translated. Um, there are tabs to get put in different languages. So definitely, you know, if language access is a barrier, um, there are options for you as well.
Um, I think that about sums up. Gosh, is there anything we're missing <laughs> with all the vaccine and COVID stuff? Uh, just uh, uh, how the, um, we just wanted to mention that the Somerville restaurants are still running uh, at a 25% capacity. Um, statewide, you know, that, that could be as much as 40%. Uh, but just, uh, just noting that, you know, region, regionally, that Somerville has been traditionally very cautious uh, when it comes to like phased reopenings. And that certainly still is the case. Um, just being mindful, you know, the city council and the mayor, uh, the mayor's administration are, is looking at the data and making, making these determinations based on that. And um, that's, that's, uh, that's something that um, restaurant owners, I'm sure, and certainly, you know, people that want to attend restaurants are, are watching. Um, mm -hmm. I, have you have you heard anything about that? Um, oh my gosh! I mean, yes. I, I haven't, frankly, done any dedicated reporting around that at the moment. Um, I've been kind of focusing on schools, focusing on policing. It's something I do hope to dedicate some time to soon. Um, but I mean, so so many restaurants are also in hibernation right now. Um, that you know, a lot of a lot of them kind of threw in the towel and was like, we're just gonna pause for a second. Um, so it's not currently been my focus, but it's something I, I would like to be looking more into. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I will be talking with um, Jessica Eshleman and um, Jen Atwood uh, from Union Square Main Streets and East Somerville Main Streets, uh, along with two businesses in their district to kind of get the, the business perspective on that. So that's something to look out for in the next few weeks. That's great um, to hear. Thank you for the update, Julia. Of course. And, um, you know, related to this, uh, of course, is education. Mm -hmm. um, kids mostly have been uh, being educated, uh, attending school virtually, um, which is stressful, <laughs> to say the least, um, but also necessary. So uh, what, what have you heard? Uh, what's the latest on the reopening process? Sure. Uh, so there's a lot going on with this right now, which is why I've been wanting to dedicate more time to it. Um, you know, the, there's the latest news and there's kind of what's been happening. So the latest is that um, the high school passed its final inspection. The new high school passed its final inspection on February 11th um, and will therefore be available um, for students soon. So the district is in the process of preparing that building, um, as well as some others, though I don't have that confirmed. So I, I don't want to name names. Um, for students, some students to resume in-person instruction um, the first and second week of March. Um, wow. So it's it's kind of finally on the calendar, if you will. Um, I think there's more to be figured out. And obviously, you know, the district has a lot of variables <laughs> to manage. You know, there's teachers needing time off in order to set up those classrooms. They're setting up high school classrooms for kindergarten students. Like there's just a lot you know what I mean, going on. So, but in terms of kind of where, we're, where we stand today, that's kind of the latest news, um, but boy, has it been a process <laughs> to get here and we're not through it. Um, so, you know, my, my reporting lately has focused on a couple of things that, you know, Somerville, what's Somerville doing in comparison to other districts, you know, cause you're right, right now, the vast majority of Somerville students have been all remote since essentially almost a year ago, since last March, when schools closed on March 16th. Um, that's not the case for all other districts. It is for some of our neighbors. You know, Cambridge has in-person students. Medford has in-person students. Chelsea and Everett do not. You know, they've, they have some e-learning centers where students can come exist in school buildings to have a little bit of support during their virtual learning um, because they may not have access to internet or things like that at home. But there is no in-person instruction and negotiations are ongoing. Um, so Somerville is, is, you know, not the only one just you know i feel like that's kind of been thrown around we're the last district and that's not true um you know for example chelsea and everett have been especially hard hit um by this by this virus um and you know it's you can see that persisting today their percent positivity ratings are much much higher than somerville's um but that's also why a lot of parents are saying hey somerville's doing pretty good you know what i mean we should be opening schools um, so that's kind of one piece of it. The other piece is um, building updates. Um, back in November, the city council approved mi uh, millions, several millions, I think it was about 4.5 million, which um, combined with 3 million from the from CARES Act funding um, has been put towards upgrading a Somerville schools like HVAC, humidification and disinfection like air systems, right? So 
these have been going on for a long, 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 long time. And I think a lot of people knew when these started that it wasn't going to be quite as fast as everyone said, construction always takes time, right? There's risk. Um, but a lot of, a lot of families are, are really frustrated with how this has stretched on. So I would just say that, you know, we're, we're looking at that. Um, the school, the new high school, thankfully, because it's brand new, ha- was built with a brand new system. You know what I mean? So those were the upgrades that kind of finishing up for that was just it being finished up as a, as a brand new building. <laughs> I think there was like a stairwell fire evacuation test. That was the last thing it had to pass. You know what I mean? Um, so that's kind of a little bit separate, but there is some controversy because for example, the Brown school is incredibly old and it was determined that there's no, there's no timeline in which that school is going to be safe to inhabit. So the Edgerly building was another one. I think they're trying to make the full circle classrooms available for students, but not trying to kind of upgrade the whole building because it's just too old. Um, the Winter Hill is another one that was just announced that that might not be on- online until next fall. So this does present some challenges because Somerville's model is kind of a neighborhood school model. Most of Somerville students, not all of them, but most of them just attend the school in their neighborhood. They can walk, they walk with their parents, they can bike, whatever it is, whatever their age. Um, but transportation may also be a factor that, you know, if a student is attending the high school where they normally attend the Kennedy, you know what I mean? Who knows that that's, you know, maybe they don't have a buyer to transportation, but if they do, what happens? So that's the kind of stuff that the district is still working out. Um, and kind of along along with that, um, there, there are so many layers to this, but, you know, parents, a lot of parents are frustrated. Um, understandably, I yeah. have not been trying to teach a child in my home for a year, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I won't, you know, I won't kind of judge that at all. Um, but they've been kind of calling out the district saying you need to do this ASAP. Why hasn't this happened sooner? Um, but especially there's been a focus recently on um, kind of vulnerable families. So um, Latino families, families who've been disproportionately impacted by COVID and what they want. I mean, so at a recent city, at a recent school community meeting, um, one uh, mother read out a bunch of testimony that she had collected kind of in Spanish during, in a WhatsApp group. Um, of parents saying, you know, we desperately want our children back in schools. Um, On the other hand, I've spoken to some parents um, through connections with the Welcome Project who have said, you know, I'm not so sure, like, I don't really understand the plans and I'm going to wait until like my family is vaccinated until I send my kids back to school. Um, So there's kind of been some like who, who wants what kind of representation. And of course you can't represent an entire vulnerable community with one voice. You know, every family is different. It, across the board. Um, but there have been more conversations about that. So I think the student, the district has been really kind of trying to increase their outreach and education about this reopening plan and why it's safe. Um, and also, for example, I was speaking with the superintendent uh, yesterday, and she was saying that they're making a real effort to have um, a number of translators at this upcoming school committee meeting when they kind of really address a little bit more nitty gritty about this reopening plan so that they have the ability to hear and translate testimony and responses from um, parents who speak multiple languages. Um, So there's, that's kind of an overview. Um, You know, there's the conversations about buildings, conversations about language and equity access, where Somerville is in comparison to other districts. Um, But now, you know, it's like, here we are, some upgrades are made, you know, students are gonna be in buildings soon. Um, And the other piece of this is that the Somerville Teachers Union, the Somerville Educators Union has been negotiating an agreement for months since August with the district of how the teachers are going to feel safe in these classrooms. And that was finally voted on last week by the union, um, overwhelmingly approved. And it was approved by the school committee uh, last night as we're recording this on the 18th. So it was approved on the 17th. Um, So so that's another, and there is more to negotiate. I will say the teachers, um, the union president mentioned that there's much more to get at, but this was specifically about um, kind of setting metrics and thresholds to make sure that teachers felt like they knew like when it was and wasn't safe to be in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. And that kind of focused on like how many classrooms are remote at the same time, right? Because the city has said, you know, they're gonna be testing students once um, once or twice a week, staff once or twice a week, um, and hopefully be getting kind of real time data about all this. So if there's a positive case, they'll be able to kind of shut down 
cohorts shut down classrooms relatively quickly, um, which theoretically you should be able to severely limit any spread and protect everyone involved. Um, but the teacher said, hey, like, I think a good metric to measure kind of whether this is safe to continue would be how many classrooms are closed at the same time. Because if there are a ton of classrooms who are remote, then there's obviously more community spread and school spread going on. You know what I mean? We have to we have to look at this and take everyone's safety into account. So that's just one example. Right. Um, but that is just to say, I'm sure <laughs> you're like yawning. No, I'm, I'm teasing. Um, there's, there's a lot here, right? Like there's so many factors and so many stakeholders, you know, the yeah. district, the city, parents, the union. Um, there's just, and whether someone lives in a multi-generational household, whether people have been vaccinated, there is just so much. It's a lot it's, to navigate. It has been up to now. So yes. You know, actually talking about setting a date to to get kids back in the classrooms is is uh, great, and then just working to make sure that everything is put in place to do that as safe as possible. It's it's a tremendous challenge, and um, yeah, one that's happening not only in Somerville; it's happening in cities every everywhere. Yes. Um, and it's a, it's a question, especially as the weather gets better as, as uh, fingers crossed case counts go down from where they were and stay down, um, you know, it's, it's uh, reopening, it's part of the whole reopening process um, that thankfully, I'm looking forward to the problem of reopening <laughs> because, uh, you know, that, that means that we've passed a threshold or we're on our way to somewhere better. So yeah, fingers crossed. True. <laughs> Uh, and finally, um, you have some news about uh, police appointments uh, within the city. And yes, yeah, so, so kind of going? all the way in the other direction, right? So, um, so I definitely I won't get too far into this because this stuff is even more convoluted. Can you can you sense a theme? I really like just diving into stuff, don't I? Anyways, um, so I have kind of been taking a deeper look at police appointments and the police hiring process in Somerville, um, especially because kind of since protests over the summer and participation in the budget process last summer. Um, I've noticed that the Somerville community is really interested and engaged in what's going on with kind of police and hiring and all of that. So there's been an increased focus on that. Um, so there kind of recently, end of January, beginning of February, um, there was another round of um, police hirings, hires, sorry. Um, so I kind of took that opportunity to, to just look at it a little bit deeper. Um, and I, I won't get into kind of the nitty gritty of the process here because it's, it's a lot. <laughs> I don't think we have another like 30 minutes. Um, however, um, I wanted to kind of just highlight some of, some of what I've done. So um, the, you know, the Somerville is part of the civil service system, which is a state system. It's kind of how we hire our officers. When you want to be a police officer, you take a civil service test. And then that, the state generates a list based off of how people did on that test, whether or not they're a veteran, whether or not they're a resident of the city, um, whether or not they have a relation on the police force. Um, this is also related to fire hiring, um, hiring for the fire department, but I'm just going to focus on policing. Um, so there's like, that's the kind of state service process. I think 350 out of the like almost 400 cities and towns in Massachusetts use the civil service process. Um, so I kind of have been looking at that a little bit deeper and how that relates to the police hires. Um, but then also looking at something called the reserve list, um, which is something that cities and towns in Massachusetts can elect into using. Um, it's also something that is rather controversial. So Somerville is one of only a handful of cities and towns in Massachusetts that use that model. Um, and the city council over the past couple of years has repeatedly called for the city to abandon that model and stop using it. Um, so this is kind of relevant because recently um, the city has said that there are there are some vacancies that need to be filled in the actual police department, but because Somerville uses the reserve list model, it's almost like there's an in-between. So instead of hiring directly to the force, we hire to the reserve list and then hire from the reserve list to the force. And there are arguments kind of for and against this. Um, for example, the city says that this is really helpful because it, it means that the city council and the city can vet candidates before vacancies become urgent. Um, and it also means that candidates are kind of pre-vetted before, um, they have to be pre-vetted before they go to the police academy. Um, and not every person who we send to the police academy makes it through the police academy. Sometimes people drop out. Um, so this is kind of a way to get, get ahead of that. When you have more candidates on the reserve list, you can send them and kind of account for the fact that not every candidate will make it through the police academy. Um, and like I said, if you, you can also hire to the reserve list without a current vacancy. So you can hire with an anticipated 
vacancy. So if you're just saying like, hey, you know, Joe's going to be retiring in July. We are going to hire to fill that now because it takes several months to get into the academy and then the academy takes six months. So we're going to start that process now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, which is all rather logical. Um, but the city council has argued that the city has kind of stacked the reserve list in the past. There is some precedent for that. Um, saying that if you hire too many people to the, the reserve list, once a candidate has been hired to the reserve list, they are no longer kind of, you know, subject to that civil service system, which gets regenerated every two years with that new test. So if you were at the top of the list, but you weren't hired in that two year period, you got to take the test again. You know what I mean? And then you're going to get a new placement on that list. The reserve list cuts that out. So if you're hired to the reserve list, when that two years comes and that there's a new test that's going to be administered, you get to hang out on the reserve list. You don't have to retake that test. Oh. Um, at this, right. And the city has argued that, for example, veterans advocates are often against the use of the reserve list because deployed veterans who come home and want to become an officer or a firefighter may take the test. But if they're city or town has a full reserve list and that's how they hire officers, then they might not ever be even interviewed mm. during that two year period mm. because the city has a reserve list that they're hiring off of directly to the force. So these are kind of complicated and controversial processes. I wanted to kind of bring attention to it because I did write a long article um, kind of diving into those and how they're relevant in Somerville. Um, so there's that is kind of available on our website, but more directly, the police, the city council has been reviewing appointments to the reserve list. And there's some controversy there around, um, for example, the city just recently reviewed three candidates and voted against appointing one of them. Um, it's, you know, a lot of it happens in executive session, which means it happens privately because it's personnel information. Right. So the public is not always kind of have, has access to things like that. Um, but if you kind of, I, I wrote a series of articles kind of walking through like um, why, why the city council felt like they had to um, vote against that appointment, um, what we can understand from the civil service process, which candidates were passed over or not passed over. Um, and I, I just kind of bring this up because like I said at the beginning, I know that this is something people are interested in. And I'll just say that for me myself, it's taken some seriously dedicated time to understand <laughs> and then be able to reproduce. Um, and I hope that um, kind of some of this more kind of base level kind of explainer reporting will help people just engage with the process more down the line. Because like I did a whole bunch of research to just kind of understand it and then just kind of wrote about it. So hopefully everyone else could too. And then there's like the actual stuff that's going on. There's like the actual appointments being considered and the various names and how, who was chosen off the list and who wasn't and the interview process and people are appealing, you know, there's, there's a lot to this. Um, but I wanted to raise it because I, I hope that it's kind of an opportunity for kind of residents who are interested to just learn more about the process and then engage with it kind of further down the line. So yeah, that's the kind of police police line. <laughs> well, th thanks, Julia. Yeah. And I, yeah, I appreciate how in depth you get with, uh, with your, uh, with what it is that you choose to be in depth about um, yeah. <laughs> that's determined over there at the Somerville Journal. Um, no, the, your passion for it is really, I, I'm going to go read those articles right now. And if anybody is curious about these articles, uh, any or anything else that we've talked about, or just, you know, want to know what's going on locally, head over to somerville.wickedlocal.com, uh, read Julia's articles, support local news. Um, you can also visit us at somervillemedia.org uh, to learn more about Somerville Media Center, to see our Somerville Neighborhood News video offerings, including this roundup right here. So until the next roundup, um, I, I will be seeing you, Julia. I'll be happy to be joined with you once again. Oh, someday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Amazing. <laughs> All right. Take care, Julia. Thank you. Thank you.